Alrighty, hello every folks, and good morning. Welcome to a uh, kind of conclusionary thoughts here on Unicorn Overlord. I just beat the thing. I'm pretty sure that was the uh, the true ending that I heard being mentioned. Um, man, that ending was uh, probably, hands down, probably one of the most difficult SRPG endings I think I've ever seen to anything. Um, like, you know how the end of every Fire Emblem ever basically just has a, the stakes are impossible now, you know, like, just big old dramatic ending, and most of the time you're so overpowered by that point that you just curb stomp it. Um, now imagine if those stakes mattered and you had to min-max the bejesus out of your team to even stand a shot or even land a hit on the guy. It's... man. <laughs> like, I was expecting a boss. I wasn't expecting, like, one boss followed by a uh, quartet of bosses, followed by a giga boss, followed by yet another giga boss. <laughs> With, uh, with basically uh, infinite uh, elite squads of units and whatnot countering everything. Um, but, uh, but yeah, man, it is, it's such a fun puzzle to solve, though. Uh, so I, I gotta say, from, from start to finish, I just thoroughly enjoy this game. I, like, I'm, right now I'm already uh, getting ready to uh, start another playthrough on, uh, on TZ mode and stuff like that. I was really surprised to see that there's actually post-game content and stuff like that, that there's new stuff that opens up in the world and all that, uh, that they give you... I actually saw some folks uh, asking uh, whether you'd be able to go revisit uh, previous uh, kind of previous uh, situations for your, like, for your world state and whatever else. Sure enough, yeah, as soon as you beat the game, you're allowed to just go uh, trigger uh, different world states and whatever else. Um, so kind of a more directly uh, directly push the button and go to where you want to go uh, version of the uh, uh, kind of a wheel system from Tactics Ogre. Um, but anyway. Well, I mean, granted, this doesn't exactly have a crazy amount of world states, to be fair, but still. Um, I, I just really appreciated the inclusion there. So, okay, uh, a couple of thoughts, by which I mean very many thoughts. Um, unfortunately, this is not going to be another two-hour long one, because I don't have that much time today. So, okay, um, as far as the difficulty of this game is concerned, I have no, like, qualms with it whatsoever. In my mind, this thing has been impeccably balanced from top to bottom. But here's the thing. I feel like the direction that many have been coming from in terms of criticizing it in that particular regard, um, I did see some folks that uh, that were mentioning that, uh, you know, cheesy stuff that worked in Expert still worked in Truth Norian or whatever else, um, which, sure, fine. Uh, that's all well and good. But, I mean, that's going to be the nature of SRPGs in general. It is, it, at the end of the day, a static machine. There's only so much that you can do with it um, before stuff starts breaking. And clearly their intention was to make you want to use as many different units as possible. Units hard counter you, units ambush you. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of play between these different units here. Um, and I gotta say, the uh, I, I finally experienced this arena that people were talking about. Um, actually uh, ended up going into exactly one multiplayer match, uh, got paired with a team that was barely put together, uh, took my free easy win, and uh, <laughs> called it good, because then I looked at all the other teams and it's like, huh, okay, so absolutely everybody here would melt these guys with no question. Fantastic. Um, but the arena basically solidified something that I've kind of had in my head for the last few parts here, which is the fact that uh, Unicorn Overlord is basically the armored core of SRPGs. Um, that it's specifically Armored Core 3 and Armored Core 6. Um, it has that Armored Core 3 uh, kind of factor where immediately upon starting the thing, you've got all these different options. It's there, uh, kind of built together in this uh, very FromSoft kind of, uh, kind of direction. Um, where you've got a, essentially a world that is completely filled with ways to potentially make your team absolutely busted under certain conditions, um, but it's up to you to figure out how to use all of these disparate tools to your advantage. By themselves, they won't necessarily mean very much, but once you find the right combinations of the right things, you basically have a like little puzzle box of all kinds of different options at your different uh, different fingertips here. Um, and once you uh, like once you have all these different pieces, it lets you do all kinds of crazy nonsense and what have you. Um, so I feel like a lot of the uh, I, like a lot of the criticisms I've seen aimed its way as far as its difficulty. No, I feel like it's perfect, perfectly balanced exactly where it should be. It is, again, not to use the tired old thing that everything gets compared to, but Dark Souls was solid ass design, okay? Um, and it is balanced in that same exact way. Again, when you know you know. Like, when you know how to beat things, you know how to beat things. Um, but that first experience is something absolutely insane, and it's really fun to go back to on challenge runs and things like that. It is a very fun format, 
very few companies have the have the chops to be able to actually pull that kind of stuff off. Uh, many try, most fail. But whenever they, whenever that feeling actually hits, it is something very special. So, like in this case, <laughs> the moment, the entire reason I was on this island to begin with, for the sake of context, I was figuring. I was basically done with the game, you know, I, I had played for like 40 hours at this point. Um, I thought I was basically done with it, so I was looking for the last cutscene to uh, to go get Elaine hitched in order to be able to, you know, go finish off that whole thing, do whatever it was that the ring was supposed to be doing, and then proceed on to the, uh, the finale there. Now, little did I know that I actually could have done this a long time ago. See, I, I'd cleared out uh, all of uh, Elfheim there, um, I'd finished off uh, Pistorius and things like that, but I had missed a shortcut. I actually ended up going back and finding this later, because I cleared out the entirety of Albion, almost, and then I was like, well, I still didn't see this cutscene that's supposed to be over here, what gives? So I ended up going back, um, uh, I ended up uh, going back on the other side, and finding uh, a similar sh uh, shortcut to the one that was in Elheim uh, over in uh, Pistorius there, which ended up taking me to the other side of the island into one hell of a cool uh, fight with uh, essentially kind of a uh, amphibious landing going on in the middle of your fight, uh, which was uh, just pretty darn cool to see. Um, and over the course of this, uh, this kind of amphibious landing situation, um, you know, you're sending out the flyers to go harass the boats. You're you're uh, sending out other units to go intercept the units that they're landing on on uh, uh, to go uh, take this neutral faction you're supposed to be protecting. All the while trying to take out the boss that's uh, guarding the area. Ultimately, the actual direct combat difficulty of one unit versus another is completely irrelevant in the sea of other mechanics. This whole thing that honestly, yes, one squad should be able to beat another, but honestly, is anybody complaining that a chess, that a queen is overpowered in chess? No, because they can just as easily die to a pawn if they're played badly. Um, it is that kind of perfect balance there. It's one of those reasons that I've been saying for a little while now that I don't think it necessarily needs a directly harder difficulty in terms of levels and things. Those are perfectly fine, and especially once you get into the ending, you realize more and more that adding more levels is not going to solve anything. This is actually a little bit of a trap that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, rebalance mods and things like that fall into, um, in which they'll go and they'll boost the levels, and oh, it seems so hard and hardcore right from the get-go, and then you realize that it was completely pointless because you're back where you started. The player catches up on those levels, and it was meaningless. It was a little bit of extra grind and a little bit of extra inconvenience, but ultimately it's a road bump uh, onto getting to the same place as you were, but now everything is a bit more diluted. Uh, whereas this entire system was clearly balanced against itself in its kind of own little context here. So the level thing, no, but adding new mechanics is always interesting. And that's what they seemingly did with this uh, true Norian mode there, uh, adding, you know, effectively a permadeath mechanic, uh, having the number of items, but more interestingly, preventing you from actually using any of those uh, Cornash items that uh, that were really useful in Expert. Uh, that's kind of the real uh, kind of game changer there. So when I <laughs> when I see folks mention that, you know, it didn't work for them in terms of not necessarily changing things, in the uh, in some ways I can kind of get it because towards the late game items are not going to be enough to actually get you through anything anyway. Um, but I do feel like uh, like it would change enough stuff to at least give it a different flavor. As far as being a like, true, this is kind of the difficulty everybody should play kind of mode, I, I think it does that job perfectly. But I'm pretty sure, given the amount of backlash and given uh, what we've seen uh, in terms of uh, the fact that they added a Ultra Baby mode when the game was first launched and uh, some folks were having difficulty in the intro, I have a feeling we'll probably end up seeing a DLC or an update or something like that with some kind of masochist mode down the line. I don't think it needs it, but either way, I'm pretty sure, uh, given what we've seen so far, and the fact that they apparently did this for Dragon's Crown, I can't personally say that one myself, but I saw somebody mention this, um, I think that that's something we'll see down the road. Now, let me get back to uh, to this uh, kind of journey towards the end game here. Because I finally experienced this arena that uh, folks were, uh, were complaining was a bit too easy to go through. You know what, I've got no notes on that arena. You know why? because that's the damn Armored Core Arena. That is the exact same formula that, that, that uh, they used over there. You get the occasional overpowered item, you mostly get a bunch of uh, rando stuff you could have gotten from the store already, but all of the teams are built uh, with fun uh, type themes and fun, uh, fun little uh, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, just ideas to them. I love the fact that there's a uh, effectively an unemployed miner squad that's your <laughs> very, uh, very first fight, and then they've just basically been jacked to all hell in the uh, sort of post-arena. I love that there is a post-arena. I love that there's a randomized arena. Again, Armored Core Ninebreaker. Anyone that's an Armored Core fan, like, you know what the hell I'm talking about. It's that, exactly. Um, the post-arena, again, my absolute favorite thing. And again, 
the, seeing the uh, the top end teams, especially the top end of the post arena, being essentially representatives from every single continent and everything else, is the most Leos Klein shit I've, <laughs> I've seen since uh, since the Armored Core arena in its uh, in its entirety. I love the type theming there. I love the fights that are in there. They are a really fun thing. Um, I don't think that that needs to change at all. Like. They, Apparently, they've updated a lot of the uh, reward structure uh, type of stuff to make sure that you can't cheese the online things. But I gotta say, even after completing the kind of primary version of the arena with a team that was already in the uh, in the late game in their 40s and stuff like that, uh, it still was a case where, you know, they they still uh, only got about uh, 1,200 points, which was enough to buy one item. It wasn't even enough to access about half the shop. But that being said. Um, I can definitely see how people would have uh, cheesed it with things like uh, like Thieves and Poison and whatever else, and honestly, this is a single-player game. I don't see that as a problem. Um, like, actually, uh, some of the loud complaints that I've seen were complaints along the lines of, like, well, this feels like uh, like going and breaking Morrowind again. How could they... Like, dude, breaking Morrowind kicks ass. What are you talking about? That feels fantastic. Um, so, I feel that it's exactly where it should be in order to make the system super satisfying. Um, everything feels very precise in terms of how they did things, and you can definitely tell that they had more malicious uh, ideas in mind with some of those post-arena fights, because some of those fights are absolutely brutal. Um, so anyway, uh, it, again, it's just, it, it's really fun to see that they had those ideas and this is what they... Uh, uh, this is what they uh, kind of settled on here, but in terms of the counters that units will pull out, there's more and more different types of counters that in that difficulty discussion I never really see brought up that often. Uh, and by the way, if the music's a bit too loud, hopefully this will fix it a little bit. It's always hard to tell. It's always at a kind of seemingly random level every time I do this. Um, but like, for, for example, uh, there's a fight that we'll see later on down the line. In fact, I can probably... S uh, okay, we'll, we'll skip to a, a head to it in a moment. Um, but, like, there's a fight down the line where I thought I was being sneaky, uh, getting a hold of one of those tornado generators in order to go throw a whole bunch of units away from a particular area. And sure enough, they started, uh, they started suddenly sending out hoplites with Fortress activated. Uh, we've got, uh, stuff like, uh, I already mentioned in this map with the, uh, uh, with units being sent in to go, uh, to go try and uh, sneak back the towers, because one of the big advantages that the AI has on this particular map are their uh, archer support fires. Regardless of how well built your team is, that's one of those things, that support fire is always a thing, and every now and then they will have multiple archer squads, multiple caster squads, and whatever else, and once those start stacking up, I, like, regardless of how well built your team is, you can at most resist one of them at a time, uh, or you can use a wind fairy charm, but again, the uh, typically the angry complaints insist that they are not using any items whatsoever and are somehow unpromoted and running around with only two people, and also uh, just happen to have already set their controller on fire and also are currently dead while playing it. Um, there's a lot of very sketchy stories that I've seen come up in the comments that don't seem to actually make sense mathematically, but again, I mean, this is kind of general RPG discussion. Weird, scuffy, ultimate sweatlord bullshit will happen. <laughs> I mean, every RPG will have this. It's one of the fun things of the genre, of being able to break things in very creative ways. Um, if somebody wanted a, uh, you know, ultra-hardcore strategy sim, they would probably be uh, going and, you know, playing them some Long War or something like that. And even in that case, there's still a lot of that uh, kind of mathematical equation kind of stuff. Okay, I guess close combat exists for them. Um, you know, go, go play some Hearts of Iron or something. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and pass on that. Um, I tried getting into, uh, to HOI at, at some point, and, like, this is, this, like, I love simulations and things like that, but, man, this, this is kind of slow. <laughs> um, like, if I'd gotten into that sooner, I probably would be covering that instead, but, anyway. Okay, so let me get back to it here. So, late game kind of stuff. Uh, set pieces continued being awesome. Even ultra overpowered, uh, going and clearing through all of, uh, like, Dragonhold and stuff like that, it felt like, yeah, wow, these guys are complete goobers and we are curb stomping their entire country back to life. Um, basically, uh, just, uh, <laughs> doing the, uh, the Bad Company 2 thing of just repeatedly smashing them with a defibrillator in the face until they somehow live again. Um, it felt like the uh, the prince that was running the place was utterly incompetent, and quite frankly, seeing his performance in the final fight, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and stick with that. Actually, one of those things I really enjoyed was the sort of uh, kind of New Vegas-esque thing of uh, the factions that you interacted with 
actually bothering to show up in the ending. That was pretty cool there. Um, and the fact that they actually use the mechanics from their uh, from their respective stuff was just kind of neat. Um, I already saw multiple moments where there could have been different interactions, so I don't know the entire extent of all that stuff. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't been documented or whatever else. And I just finished this thing like an hour ago, so I wouldn't have had time to go look it up. But still... Still, it was just awesome to see the those moments of uh, essentially uh, kind of reclaiming the mind control of uh, certain units or whatever else. Um, you know, having other guys uh, show up with armies, uh, having some units uh, show up as just kind of hero squads and what have you. It was just cool to see. And I could see if somebody was going for a speedrun kind of thing, that they would have had a much harder time there. And actually, I'm pretty sure they would have gotten a pretty scuffed ending. Um, I love the fact that there are seemingly different endings. Um, and additionally, the, the actual uh, epilogue, just like uh, just like in the Ogre Battle games, does seem to actually adapt for your relationships. I don't know to what extent, but I noticed people that had relationships uh, when I was going and playing through it tended to show up together in cutscenes, which was especially weird because I had had several units uh, rotating in and out of Elaine and Chloe's squad, who were kind of the power couple of this, uh, this little army here. Um, and it was very funny to see that uh, Chloe is just going over there teleporting to all kinds of different continents every other cutscene. <laughs> it was like, hi, I'm over here too. <laughs> I had a relationship with these people. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was it was just kind of uh, kind of neat to see. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, man. Yeah, I, I know that uh, I, I'm already looking forward to doing several challenge runs of this thing. Like to start off with, definitely, uh, I definitely gonna have to. Uh, just probably gonna have to start off with like some single class runs or something like that. Um, unpromoted definitely seemed viable. Uh, the, I actually, originally I thought it was going to be a problem, but then looking at uh, at the kinds of tools that are available, I think uh, unpromoted is uh, is definitely going to be doable. Um, funnily enough, uh, I actually saw one comment uh, asking if uh, if it was uh, something Fire Emblem inspired. So whenever there's unpromoted runs in any one of these games or something like that, not many games that I cover actually have direct promotions. Um, I think I did a stream of unpromoted units uh, back um, from March of the Black Queen a while ago. Um, but uh, I, I don't forget, I don't remember if that's all around because I didn't keep a lot of my Twitch stuff. But um, either way. Uh, as far as all that stuff goes, it actually started, believe it or not, with Pokemon Ruby, uh, <laughs> where originally I was like, I wonder what happens if I use just babies throughout the entire thing when I was a kid, and, and uh, sure enough, it wound up being very satisfying. Um, okay, one more thing I wanted to point out in terms of uh, counters and stuff. The AI is really good at actually making use of very specific counters, like right here with this particular fight. For the sake of context, I know I'm skipping over a lot of things. A few things to pay attention to right now. Every flyer that we send over the gate, uh, they will attempt to provoke that unit into a uh, essentially into uh, squads meant to counter them, uh, in uh, basically uh, units with uh, with shields and bows. Uh, so they are constantly attempting to hunt down the flyers that you try to send over the gate uh, if you try to do it that way. Um, actually, the rumor somebody told me of being able to open the gate from the other side, at least for this gate, is not true. So I don't know what that was about. But additionally, you notice how there's three. Uh, uh, three lumps of various units up there at the at the top. Uh, so those uh, had all actually uh, come in over the course of this fight, uh, being the only ones that were actually able to cross over the mountains uh, at, with this whole giant set piece fight here. Um, and it's interesting because they actually give you uh, all of these uh, allied units who up to this point were just being pacifist, but as soon as uh, the uh, kind of shit gets real moment happens, they actually assist in the charge forward uh, throughout the uh, basilica here. Additionally, then those units come around and then they will be chasing them and you're kind of left with this thing of like, you can technically keep these pretty decent units alive as extra meat shields and things like that. Um, like, do you spend the the, uh, the points to keep them rolling? Do you just let them uh, kind of uh, burn themselves out and kind of kind of lose that advantage there. Um, I know I personally uh, let them get tired so that I had time to actually keep up uh, with their uh, uh, unfortunately quick advance here. Um, you have this gigantic, like, blob that's just going and careening through the gates here. It, oh, man, it feels so freaking cool. Um, so I loved this fight. I, frankly, all the big fights, even when they were... Uh, uh, even when we were vastly outclassing them and stuff like that, just, like, thematically, they felt amazing. Um... So like, uh, so, like, those moments where, like, in, in Dragonhold, when we went back, units were, on average, like, 9 to 14, and we were 40-plus at that point. Yeah, sure, they were curb-stomping, but it was really cool to see stuff like the Arena's Champion popping out to uh, to go assist in the fight, or uh, to see those moments uh, where they basically show uh, approach you after, uh, after the fight, and they're like, okay, look, win the Arena, and I'll join you, but you got your demo, you're not getting this unit uh, uh, any other way. Um... So just kind of a cool way to uh, to lock that recruit there. Uh, again, just I, I love the arena there. Um, 
if you end up approaching it early, I feel like it would have a very Armored Core 3 esque feel. And the thing is, they even kept in a lot of the little stuff. See, one of those things that I saw with those uh, difficulty complaints were that uh, they didn't do more brutal things. And this is, again, something that you see in a lot of very well designed games, quite frankly, because it's oftentimes, uh, like, it's more fun. Uh, to go uh, to go fight things that are interesting more so than directly difficult. And the reason that I keep bringing up Armored Core is because we had that particular thing with that series. Where Armored Core 3 was, again, a, a feeling very similar to this one. That your first time through, you don't know what's going on, it might seem somewhat difficult. Yes, I know, objectively, that game is super freaking easy now that we know how to play it. But back in the day, I saw several people that insisted that it was one of the hardest games that they'd played. Partially because of the controls, partially because of the fact that everybody's on an even playing field. So, the thing is entirely basically a skill check that doesn't necessarily, you know, take it too easy on you, especially in hard mode. Now, the funny thing is, the funny thing is that, yeah, once you go back to it, once you know, it, again, ends up being on the easy side. But, uh, for example, things like, uh, like all the hidden parts, like a, a new player goes in and they're using their starting AC, they're using their starting parts, they're slow, they're clunky, they, uh, they end up falling off of a bridge because they don't have enough energy to fly over it. Whereas what happens with a returning player, right? They see the beam on the right side. They will forever use that beam to go walk across that bridge instead. They'll go in, for example, uh, uh, go to the arena, win the first fight, go pick up their free uh, missile launchers, go sell those to go get some high-efficiency boosters, a high-capacity generator, fly under the bridge, go collect the head in the portable version, uh, sell that head for parts because it's not very great, um, but then go and... Um, uh, but then essentially go and sell their starting legs, sell their booster, in order to have uh, 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 hover legs uh, that they can now infinite boost, uh, courtesy of the uh, the tap, uh, I guess it's a glitch, <laughs> in order to be able to go ridiculously fast, swap out their uh, uh, their rifle for an energy weapon so that they're not spending ammo, swap out their core for a uh, energy machine gun uh, so that they again have more firepower without any additional cost. All of these things are something that the returning player absolutely can just go and curb stomp the game with, and does that mean that the game lost any value in terms of being easy? Hell no. That's just discovery and good play being rewarded. And ultimately, yeah, they will still run into issues when stuff happens. And this is, like, I, like, Armored Core 3 is one of those games that I've gone and i probably played through over a hundred times at this point. I've been playing it since I was a little kid. I love going through it every month or so. Um, I'll just sit down and go do an entire playthrough of the thing, and I still end up uh, going and taking, a, you know, taking stupid losses regularly. Because, again, a lot of the difficulty assumptions that are coming, especially for this game, for that, for those games, come from this idea that people are always doing everything perfectly all the time, which is just simply not true. Uh, you will make mistakes, you will get tired, you will have weird moments, or you might be doing a challenge run, and that's when a lot of the systems really get to shine. Like, those moments that you overlooked something, somebody's just out of swap range, and suddenly now you have a completely different situation with your units. It's just really fun to see, you know? So as far as I'm concerned, yeah, the, the difficulty of this thing from beginning to end has been exactly where it should be on Expert. What I would say is that it didn't need the three bottom difficulties at all and just make it Expert on up. Um, frankly, my only issue difficulty-wise is the fact that uh, anyone that I've spoken to that played it strictly on Strategic and was saying that they cheesed it through with items and items are super overpowered, they're not getting, like, the... I know it sounds kind of uh, kind of uh, gatekeepy to say, but they're not really getting the real kind of experience of uh, of what makes this game good. This whole thing of you know keeping your units in particular formations to go swap them around, that uh, the timing equation of getting people where they should be when. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, yeah, it didn't really need the easier difficulties, but again, you know, they wanted to keep it accessible. Fair enough. Whatever. It is what it is. Okay. So uh, also. Um, hang on, let me see here. There we go. I can go ahead and skip a, ahead a few parts here. Ultimo, we did end up getting through this. I'm a little bit short on time today, so I'm not going to make it an ultra-long one. Um, by the way, this dude, like, totally not Ramza, ends up doing the totally not Ramza thing. I know, it's a shocker. Um, okay. There was the, uh, the cutscene I was talking about. That was looking high and low for this one stupid cutscene. It was behind the boats the whole time. So I'm going to skip a few clips ahead here. Look at this. They're, like You get halfway through the map, you save the neutral faction here. They're just going and they're doing amphibious landings. They're sending out... Uh, they, they literally have medieval aircraft carriers going and buzz-bombing you. Like, it, it, that's such a... I, it's so freaking cool, you know? And again, 
even the defensive units, it's not every uh, situation that they're actually able to take complete 100% wins. Um, so in a lot of cases, they end up uh, getting chip damage. A lot of times, uh, like this old squad ended up getting very, very noticeably bogged down and run down before the end of the fight here. Um, I had one squad that was desperately trying to kill off the boats. And I, I, again, I, another point of very intentional design here, because uh, I know I've seen a comment about this somewhere, but this moment right here, where you are specifically looking for those kind of almost Frogger-esque openings to be able to go attack the boat when the flyers have already left, because otherwise they'll circle back around and hit you with arrows, which your flyers are weak to. Um, again, very intentional decision there, and I can tell you exactly why, because if they were constantly circling their boat, which would be objectively the smarter decision, it would be a colossal pain in the ass to go deal with it. You'd have to go bring specific counters. You can't play around a worse team composition in that situation. You would want to have purpose-built squads uh, to go in and uh, deal with them in a very particular way. You have to have squads that, uh, for example, would be a flyer, um, but would be very resistant to arrows. The flyer would be used just for movements, and then you'd have to use all heavies for the rest of it. And having an exact answer is always to the detriment of an SRPG. Effectively, these levels are just one giant puzzle box, and if there's only one key, then it's a lot less fun, you know? Um, but being able to adapt kind of adapts to bad decisions is what makes this thing so freaking fun. It's the same thing that made Ogre Battle fun, it's the same thing that makes Tactics Ogre fun. Um, it's, in my in my eyes, one of those things that always really sings to a really uh, really well-designed SRPG that's not about the grind, is how you adapt. Like, how you understand the mechanics in front of you and adapt, uh, adapt accordingly. That it's, uh, that, uh, sure, in a lot of cases there will be, you know, correct counters to something or whatnot else, but again, with good counters, that uh, gives you the ability to, uh, uh, to create the situation where somebody can maybe kind of, uh, uh, kind of basically, uh, what, what am I trying to, what's the word I'm looking for here? That they can sort of cludge together a counter when they don't really have the counter, if that makes sense. Uh, that they can sort of make a makeshift solution to their problem. And, uh, that's, like, that's one of those moments that I, that's always the most satisfying to me. Because coming up with creative makeshift solutions is just my freaking jam. I love that stuff. Um... So, like, in this case, ultimately, we ended up uh, barely surviving with that Wyvern squad. Uh, ended up using several squads to go wear this guy down. Um, and then finally, uh, finally ended up uh, running the dude down, as you do. Finally got uh, the uh, the cutscene of them two awkwardly dancing. Um, because, you know, he suddenly had to dance, and this was the only place he could possibly learn. Anyway. Uh, yeah, she gets all self-conscious, and let's go ahead and move on. Uh, this line was particularly funny to me. Um... <laughs> where she's not sure at first, like, you know, you can just tell me if, like, if this whole thing is not happening, because <laughs> this is just kind of awkward. Um, I love the random awkward moments in the in the dialogue. Um, like, the, the plot itself isn't anything too crazy, but the fact that uh, they did the character moments uh, justice always feels really good to me. Um, and in fact, I gotta say, as far as the actual conclusion to the story goes, uh, from what I can tell, I got the good ending, I'm pretty sure. I can't imagine how you'd get better than that, that ending. Um, I saw what would have been the bad ending, I'm pretty sure. Um, and to that end, I gotta say, they actually made the weird thing, like, the actual plot, I called a lot of those plot points within the first hour of trying the demo, like, months ago, right? Almost all of those predictions were correct, but the how of how they were correct uh, actually kind of surprised me. They actually went places with it. I found it kind of interesting. Um, I thought it was a cool thing. I mean, it got a little cheesy towards the end there, but, you know, it, it's fine. It's fine. Um, they made it work in a really satisfying way. Like, it, it wasn't cringy, and that's what I'm looking for. Um, then we get the lady that uh, they made the release day porn of, and then we got uh, these desert fights. They really loved their conquer all of the uh, various checkpoints uh, uh, kind of things here out in the desert. Uh, I skipped all of those things. I love the sheer scale of fights like this. Um, the number of units that, they, that they're sending in is preposterous. Um, I love that the uh, champion lady is basically the same uh, when she joins your team as she is right now. Um, uh, yeah, they... So as far as the, uh, you know, the broken items in the arena, it seemed like most of the super broken stuff started at about 2,000. You get about 1,200 for completing the arena. You gotta actually win in online fights. There's a limit to how far you can go with it. As far as I'm concerned, again, it's fine. Um, like, if somebody really, really needs to cheese that or something like that, it's nowhere near as atrocious as, uh, as like, what I've seen of the 3DS Fire Emblem games. 
uh, you know, where he had those moments where it literally <laughs> was just like, well, I guess we might as well sit and churn out those dailies and become ungodly overpowered pretty much immediately. Um, uh, there's actually uh, not only work involved, but it's actually fun to do. So either way, um, I love that. I love the fact that uh, this uh, kind of cheesy gimmick team was able to conquer most of the arena. Um, looking forward to doing more with that uh, in the next playthrough. Also, I probably uh, shouldn't... Um, I forget what her name is. Uh, like, really slutty sword lady. Probably shouldn't kill them off next time, because I never realized just how limited uh, the sword masters were uh, on my particular route. <laughs> there were basically three that were available up until the end of Pistorius. Um, uh, yeah, I was actually really surprised to see that this arena actually had a nine ball. Um, that there was actually a sudden, like, oh, you beat the champion, but you didn't beat the champion moment. Um, very, uh, very fun to see there. Uh, she promptly kicked everyone's ass until I came back with, uh, with thieves and such. Um, yeah, we saw that cutscene a few times. Uh, where was it here? Sorry I'm skipping ahead so much, but I've got, like, 15 more minutes that I can kind of sort of cover stuff, so... So there's that. Uh, this team actually, this gimmick team, did actually manage to hold up pretty darn well, uh, in this particular situation. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, ultimately, they just weren't really built for it. Ah, that's good. Good, good coffee. Okay. Skip ahead, then we get the uh, the Gigaboss fight. Yeah, that was, uh... She, uh... <laughs> she is a solid example of what to start expecting before the end of the game. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, that, that, that was kind of hilarious over there. That's uh, the first thing that they're considering with Lady is her friggin' ginormous size. Like, oh, she's gonna eat all our food, uh... Okay. <laughs> Weird place to start, but alright. Um, okay, online features. Was really happy with the fact that you could actually pick your custom portraits uh, that you've already made uh, with your uh, your hand mirrors. Just really, uh, really solid stuff there. Uh, as far as the actual online modes, there's limitations um, on what items uh, can be used. Uh, so as far as going and cheesing out the arena for free stuff, it's not as easy as I've seen folks make it out to me. Like, at, at least not now. Uh, not only are you limited in terms of the number of fights that can actually give you rewards, uh, there's also item bans, and additionally, those item bans have gotten more strict um, since uh, since this happened. Like, this is still on the original uh, version here. Uh, the Switch updates uh, to update a lot of those item bans and uh, kind of uh, make it even harder to abuse the arena are currently still pending for the Switch. There was some kind of Nintendo shenanigans. I don't know. Some, some went on there. Uh, maybe the uh, the PS4, PS5 folks uh, can, uh, can go ahead and share some of that. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, did more desert stuff. Everybody got their ass kicked. Fantastic. Uh, oh yeah, this fight was pretty darn cool. Even, again, even when overpowered, it was just very, like, classic RPG kind of feeling here for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these moments. Oftentimes, it feels really good to go back to low-level areas while hyper-overpowered in situations like this, because you have that moment of, like, what the hell are these people thinking kind of thing, you know? And it just feels really good to be able to effectively kind of just have cheat mode on for a few fights, you know? Like, yeah, it's not uh, not going and uh, asking you to uh, to suffer every minute of the day or anything, but it makes for a really cool uh, thematic moment. And for that that particular note, uh, actually one thing that I meant to bring up last time that I did not bring up this uh, that last time and did bring up in those several failed videos I had scuffed audio for... Um, is when it comes to adding a far higher, consistent, always scaling, whatever else difficulty, okay? Ultimately, again, an SRPG is a static machine. Eventually, somebody will find a way to break it. Every every lock has a way to be picked on Earth. There is no lock, there's an exception. There's a reason that Fort Knox has armed guards, because he can't lock pick a gun. Anyway, um, as far as, well, I mean, I guess technically you can, but that's a whole other story. But anyway, what I'm trying to get at here is that when it comes to, uh, to an SRPG here, again, things will always find a way to be broken, and t you need to look no further uh, than the old uh, FFT 1.3 uh, situation. Where in the... Uh, way back in the day, uh, playing uh, FFT 1.3, uh, it's basically this, uh, this hard, uh, hard difficulty mod for Final Fantasy Tactics. And it's one of these things that was sort of held up as a... As, as a sort of like, you know, you're a, you're a real SRPG gamer if you can get through this kind of thing. Um, and the thing is, you may have noticed its reputation has been brought up less and less over time, uh, that it's gone from, uh, from like, oh, this is the super hard one, to this is kind of minorly annoying, to, yeah, you know what, it's kind of easy now that people have figured it out. 
because it's the exact same thing, where like they, they tried to add this perfect difficulty to it, and ultimately every RP SRPG will eventually be easy once you've figured it out. Uh, whether you're, you've uh, figured out the infinite money cheese back in March of the Black Queen, whether you figured out your infinite experience cheese in Tactics Ogre SNES, or you figured out uh, the anatomy combos in, uh, in Tactics Ogre PSP, or if you figured out uh, good uh, loadouts of different elements and diversity and debuffs in uh, Tactics Ogre Reborn. Even something like Baldur's Gate 3, which is held up as one of the finest RPGs ever made still has the same thing, because the other day I was watching somebody play through the entire game at going killing everything, never attacking a single thing whatsoever because they found a way to make walking overpowered. RPGs are just going to be like that. It's part of the fun of the machine. It's not meant to be an ultra-hardcore thing. It's meant to be just realistic enough that you'll buy what the kind of weird bullshit that's taking place, but it's meant to be fun enough to give you that power fantasy of, hey, you figured out how to break the system. Good for you. Here's your destruction cookie. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, yeah, the difficulty on this one is just spot on. It is exactly where it needs to be. Um, and I will get follow-up notes on TZ difficulty, but from what I've read, it is exactly what I would expect for a mode like this. And another little side note here, I mentioned last time when we ran into, uh, uh, into I Swear It's Not Limitation uh, back on some of the boss fights, in this particular area, tell me this doesn't sound like one of the, um, I forget the name of the theme. It's not Through the Plains, it's one of the FFT music themes. But that little da -da 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 kind of like little flute ditty that's going on in the background sounds very familiar to one of the themes from FFT. Um, I know that there's a lot of little subtle references in this game to, uh, to other stuff in the genre, but like, I, I really like that one. Um, this, this theme is probably one of my favorites uh, throughout all this. I don't know if you can hear it particularly well. Uh, let's maybe turn it up slightly. That might be a bit too loud. Eh, that's gonna be too loud. Okay, whatever. Uh, I'll probably make a link to it if somebody's posted it somewhere or something. I don't know, but um, uh, but anyways, yeah. I I really loved the uh, music <laughs> throughout this whole thing. Um, I love that uh, they, one of the things I saw a complaint about to a degree that I personally really love is the fact that you don't necessarily need every mechanic to always succeed at all times. Like one of the directly one of the reviews that I saw was complaining that you don't need to min max rapport in order to uh, to get overpowered. That you don't need to go min max your entire squad's uh, kind of uh, internal uh, internal politics situation in order to make them work. That you don't have to go grind out food or whatever else in order to make the experience suck for you so that it can make it not suck for you slightly or something. Anyway, personally, I really like that because it leads to a more, uh, to me, it's far more immersive not to have that there and instead have it be a nice little cookie that I can just go kind of hand out whenever stuff goes well. Like, if, to me personally, it, it's a lot more immersive to have those moments where it's like that squad did particularly well, so we went and gave them a ham and cheese casserole or some crap. Like, they get taken out to dinner for doing well. <laughs> you know, it's just, to me, that is a lot more valuable than being forced to rely on the rapport mechanic all the time, because if you have a team that's got good rapport anyway, it's probably going to get maxed out in no time at all anyway. I, I, when you get to these later fights in this game, they're potentially fighting 50, 60 plus mobs at one time. If and hopefully they'll survive. If they don't, they still get the, you know, the experience and report bonuses. Uh, but effectively, they're they're getting a ginormous amount of uh, rapport every time that they're going and fighting through a lot of these bigger fights. Um, and what I especially find awesome about this is that uh, this game kind of follows the FTL uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, philosophy as far as difficulty. Because all of this other stuff, all of these big fights, they seem like a big dramatic thing in the moment. They seem like they're going to be the big set piece. And then once you start actually going and taking on the proper endgame and stuff like that, it's like, oh, I see. This was the rebel, uh, uh, <laughs> the rebel mothership the whole time, huh? <laughs> that all of this was to set you up for that. Which, granted, they do directly tell you, but normally in, the, in games like this, you expect it to be more like, oh, I'm just going to go cheese out an easy win against the boss. Um, and... I'm sure that there's way to, ways to cheese it, but once you go send your ace squad against the guy and you're seeing a response of, hey, they're going to get hit for 3,000 plus damage, um, yeah, it's time to get a little creative. <laughs> so there's that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's just good stuff. Uh, also, uh, bear in mind, this again was was uh, with accidentally going back and almost 100%ing stuff, not actually completely 100%ing stuff, 
Um, but I was kind of in this mindset at this point of wanting to uh, to go back and see what stuff I'd missed because I did the whole ring thing. I got I got the cutscene. I did the ring thing, and then they were dropping a little hint like, uh, just so you know, there's kind of maybe something important at these locations. I mean, you don't have to, but we're just saying like maybe. And then you get part way through that, and they're like, yeah, you definitely wanted to do this, and then you finally complete it, and like, yeah, yeah, no, you. you you, bad things would have happened if you didn't do this. Actually, we just were messing with you. Um, so ultimately, ended up getting his uh, his fancy sword there. Ended up uh, uh, ended up going and uh, making several more solid teams and things like that. Um, just lots of good options. In fact, I love I love 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 the fact that the Brynhildr made it to this thing. It actually managed to come back. <laughs> I'm not going to explain how, but it managed to, to also be a thing in this. Um, it was a very satisfying thing there. Oh, man. Dude, the end game was freaking, like, absolutely nutty. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spoil what happens past this point. I'm just going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Long story short, I, yeah, Unicorn Overlord was unbelievably good. Like, not in a million years would I have expected it to be this freaking good. Um, they managed to actually make do the ogre battle thing. They manage to still keep the whole epilogue thing from something like March of the Black Queen. It does adapt to the things you do. Uh, the uh, the AI is pretty solid at countering, but only when it needs to. It manages to keep itself satisfying. It manages to actually make uh, previous relationships from the game kind of uh, stick out here, but it doesn't get too corny with it. Like, I love the fact that uh, uh, when it comes to your whole shipping your characters thing, they kind of keep it uh, They keep it uh, not Fire Emblem Awakening. You don't have the, uh, the awkward like, hey, check it out, everyone's in a friggin' bathing suit type stuff, um, that they managed to keep it tasteful. Like, tasteful, incredibly fun, and super satisfying. That's how I would describe it from start to frickin' finish. Um, anyway, so, I'm gonna leave it there. Y'all have yourselves a good one. I'll see you in the next one. Man, I love, actually, shoot, I forgot to even mention, they will still keep, keep using stuff that you've trained up, uh, and learned in random gimmick fights throughout the entire thing. You saw how part of this map is on fire? You remember how you could use the reins back in the forest? Did you miss the rains back in Africa? Because you can use those. <sighs> Damn, this game's good. All right, anyway, I gotta get going. Y'all have yourselves a good one. Take care.